Welcome to the AIER's Authors' Corners podcast. My name is Ethan Yang. I'll be your host. And today's guest is AIER Senior Fellow Tom Hogan. Before joining, joining AIER, he served as the Chief Economist for the U.S. Senate Banking and Urban Affairs Committee and currently writes about monetary policy and regulation. Tom, it's great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So today's topic is going to be on something that's been very relevant in the news lately because of current events, especially with COVID-19, and that's monetary policy. And as Tom will explain, it's been a very, very interesting year when it comes to uh, the sort of policy instruments that we've, we've been using. So just to start off for our audience, can you explain uh, what the difference between fiscal and monetary policy is, and then maybe some examples of what are uh, monetary policy tools that our government can use? Yeah, sure. Right. It, it's definitely been an interesting year or two that we've had with the COVID crisis. And now, you know, with the Biden administration making a couple of big proposals that we could have a lot of spending going on. Um, but it is important to make a distinction between monetary policy that happens with the Federal Reserve and fiscal policy that happens through the government or the Treasury. So when we think about fiscal policy, that is the normal spending that we get from the government where they're spending money that they have to get from either taxes or bonds. And so fiscal policy doesn't create new money in the economy. It's only spending that occurs from taking money away from individuals through taxes or from the financial system through the issuance of bonds. And so fiscal policy doesn't really create inflation. Even if we see a big increase in spending from the Biden fiscal plans, we might not see an increase in uh, prices due to inflation and money. Now, the Fed is the opposite. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States, and their job is to govern the supply of money. Uh, and so they try to manage it in a way that will help stabilize the economy, that, that when we're going into a recession, they try to put more money into the economy to get the economy going. If things look like they're going too hot, then they take money out of the economy. Um, but the last year or two, especially since because of the COVID crisis, uh, they've done a lot of unusual policies. And so the first big thing is that when we when we had the initial COVID contraction that uh, back in in March, people started staying home, businesses started temporarily closing. We had some some lockdowns and stay at home orders. Um, and the Fed at that time immediately started cutting interest rates and putting money into the economy, which was good. That's that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. When it looked like we were having a contraction, they want to put money in to you know, lessen the extent of that contraction. But then they also started doing some rather unusual things, the big one being the emergency lending programs that they opened up. They started putting a ton of money into the economy that they were lending to all kinds of different entities. Now, the Fed does have the ability to do emergency lending if we're having a financial crisis. But it's not clear that we were really having a financial crisis. We had a regular recession. People, you know, businesses were closed. Um, and so emergency lending doesn't help that. But the other funny thing is the ways that they were spending the money that they were lending to a lot of non banks and non financial entities. They were lending to state and local governments. They were lending to small businesses. Those are all things that the Federal Reserve is not supposed to be involved with. In fact, previous Fed chairs, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, had said that the Fed should never be involved with lending to state and local governments, with lending to non-bank institutions. Um, and so that was really a surprise and a big break with their uh, traditional responsibilities as the central bank. So let's just go over some uh, big policies that have been all over the news, like interest rates uh, near zero, uh, a big term called quantitative easing. So if you can first explain uh, what these two policies do, what what's the purpose, uh, why are we doing it to the extent that we are, and then maybe explain why we can't just do this all the time. <laughs> yeah, so that's a great question. So it's, it's a little bit unusual. Um, because of a big change that happened after the financial crisis. And so the, so it's kind of hard to, to explain that traditionally what the Fed has normally done is they manage the money supply by trying to target interest rates in the economy. And they did that through what we'd call open market operations, the buying and selling of bonds. And so when we look like we're going into a recession, um, the Fed tries to uh, go out and, and buy bonds to push the price up, to push interest rates down. And so lower interest rates encourage lending in the economy, encourage more spending, and that hopefully you know, prevents us going into a recession. However, we've fundamentally changed the way the monetary system works. The way that we were teaching economics and monetary policy 10 years ago no longer applies to the Federal Reserve and to uh, monetary policy today. And so there's a lot of confusion where I see people making these claims that, that um, just don't apply anymore. So now the way that they do um, monetary policy is the Federal Reserve 
pays interest on the uh, reserves that banks hold at the Fed. So banks take some of their cash and they put it on hold with the Federal Reserve, which acts like a banker's bank. You know, they deposit these reserves at the Fed um, and then the Fed pays them interest. And so if the Fed pays more interest, then banks are going to take more of that money and put it at the Fed and not lend it out. And so that prevents the banking system from functioning like it normally would. So normally, prior to 2008, if the Fed was doing open market operations, if they were going out and buying and selling bonds, that would create inflation, that would stimulate the economy. But now it doesn't, because when when the Fed puts bonds, uh, puts money into the economy, that money just gets turned around and put right back at the Fed because they're paying the banks not to lend it out. Um, and so that's caused this really unusual situation that the Fed has spent trillions and trillions of dollars uh, but almost none of that money makes it into the economy. If we if we think about a rule of thumb, um, roughly 90%, maybe between 80 and 90% of that, depending on what time period we're looking at, gets redeposited at the Fed and never makes it to the economy. So when you see trillions of dollars in open market spending, it's really just a much smaller amount, You know, maybe a tenth of that is actually going into the economy. So that's why we don't see big inflation like a lot of people would have been expecting. And why is it, um, when just to follow up on that, um, you, you hear about how this amount of quantitative easing and interest rates this low is, is not supposed to be sustained for a long time. So why is that? Like, why can't we just keep interest rates at zero? And why can't we just keep uh, pumping more money into the economy? Yeah. So, so, you know, eventually the economy will get going again. Uh, after the 2008 crisis, it took a lot longer than expected, partly because these monetary policies weren't very stimulative. You know, the, the Federal Reserve did trillions of dollars in quantitative easing. But like I said, very little of that money actually made it into the economy. And so it took a really long time uh, for the economy to get going again. Now, this time, things are a lot different because the COVID crisis was not a traditional recession. Um, People had to go home to try to avoid the virus. People in a lot of states were locked down and not allowed to work. Uh, but once once the virus kind of waned a little bit and states started to open up, people went back to work, you know, mostly like normal. I mean, obviously, it'll take a while before we full, get back to full capacity. Um, but by the end of last year, by November or December, we were already back to basically an average unemployment rate in the United States. But there was a huge spread between the states that had locked down and the states that didn't. The states that locked down had really high unemployment rates and the states that didn't had really low unemployment rates, historically low. We had a bunch of states with less than 4% unemployment, which is just booming. So we had this really unusual economy that was looked, if you just look at the aggregates, it looks like it's doing okay. But if you look at the individual states, some are booming and some are in huge recessions. And so over the last couple of months, you know, the lockdowns have eased. Now we see people going back to work all over the place. We're seeing, you know, kind of a boom. Um, and that is largely caused by the end of lockdowns rather than anything that's going on with the Fed or, or with fiscal policy. And so, you know, now we start to worry more about the Fed has been putting all this money into the economy. You know, what's going to happen next? Um, as long as the Fed is paying a high enough rate of interest on reserves, then we won't see very much inflation. You know, the Fed has actually been undershooting their 2% inflation target for more than a decade. You know, it averaged like 1.5% for the whole decade after the financial crisis. Um, will it be more this time? Maybe. The, the conditions look a lot better. Like I said, we weren't in a real recession. Um, but it's hard for me to believe that we'll get really high rates of unemployment. I mean, even with the huge quantitative easing, uh, sorry, real high rates of inflation, with, with the huge quantitative easing that the Fed has done, um, the most we could possibly see is, you know, maybe 5% for a couple of years. We won't be seeing 10% inflation like the 1970s. I know a lot of people are worried about that. And the Fed is, has said they're willing to let inflation get a little bit higher. But what they mean is like 3 or 4%. They don't mean double digits. And so it could be a, a, a bit of a bad situation if we see um, unemployment running high for a couple of years. Um, but it won't be anything drastic, at least quantitatively. It looks like that would be you know, almost impossible for us to get up to really high rates, at, at least right now. The Fed is still expanding their balance sheet. They are still doing some quantitative easing, so it could get a little bit, you know, uh, a bigger threat of inflation, depending on when they back that down. Um, but I worry more about the politics. Before, uh, in 2008, uh, in 2009, everyone was worried about inflation. 
Um, now the Fed is being pressured to get a little bit more inflation and keep interest rates low for longer. And so I think it's really more of a political danger than it is a danger of you know how, to, how monetary policy works. We're not in a bad position now, but we could be depending on politics. So let's move on to some of the uh, big debates going forward when it comes to uh, moving out of uh, COVID-19 and kind of dealing with the consequences of our policies. So we hear a lot of debate from economists that are we going to have runaway inflation? You just described your opinion. Um, so there's been a lot of takes on whether or not inflation is going to skyrocket. Is it just going to tread lightly or is it not going to happen at all? Um, and the second part of that is uh, the stock market. So we're seeing on major indexes, the S&P 500, the Dow, you know, tremendous gains, even though the economy is probably, you know, tanked harder than it has been in many years. Um, so we have this fundamental disconnect, um, at least according to some people, other people would say that, you know, that's because, you know, people are speculating and the stock market is just reflecting their optimism. So where would you stand on both those questions? Um, so the, regarding the stock market, I, I, I don't think it's actually much of a surprise to see a boom after the kind of uh, recession that we've had. So, you know, again, we didn't really have a fundamental problem in the economy. We just had a situation where people stayed home because of the virus and because they were locked down. It was illegal for businesses to hire workers. And now that's over and businesses are hiring again. And so it's no surprise to see a boom. Um, and in any, any, any recession, you typically see a pickup in the stock market before you see a large pickup in hiring again, because, you know, as businesses have to let people go, they start to get more efficient, they cut back. And so they, um, the profits start to increase before the hiring really increases. That doesn't always happen, but, it, but it could be what's happening right now. Um, but I think the most important to think thing to remember regarding the stock market is that the stocks are based on the present value of all future earnings for a company and so when we're looking at the price of a stock we're saying what do people expect is going to happen in the future you know at the start of uh the recession about a year ago now people were really worried and uncertain and rightly expected that businesses would have to close down for a little while that they would lose a lot of their revenues and a lot of their profits um, but we're past that point now. We're at the point now where things are going to start going well again, even if they're not great right now, we're on the uptick. Um, and so you should expect that stock prices are going to increase faster uh, than the real economy does because they're based on expectations of what will be happening in the future. Uh, and so I think that's uh, mostly what's going on. I know that a lot of people are like the inflation question, concerned about the Fed putting money into the economy and potentially inflating asset values. Um, I'm not worried about that right now. Um, we do see that we have inflation in certain parts of the economy for sure. We see certain areas uh, where housing prices are taking off, but it's largely driven by a couple of particular regions. And those are mostly areas that have done well because of COVID where people are moving out of certain states and moving to other certain states and cities. Uh, and so it's no surprise that the places where people are moving, the housing markets are booming and prices have accelerated much faster. I think there's maybe 10 or a dozen cities uh, where prices, home prices have really taken off. We're seeing the same things in a lot of manufacturing and raw materials areas. You know, lumber's one that everybody's been talking about. Um, and so those kind of uh, inputs are in short supply right now because people haven't been able to produce them for a whole year. And so it's no surprise that that prices are going to, going to go up there. Uh, wages as, as well. We've seen wages being driven up by a couple of good employment reports. But part of that, part of the reason that that wages are increasing is we're having a shortage of labor supply because of the increase in unemployment benefits that the government is now paying people more than they could possibly make at their old jobs to stay home and, you know, not take a new job. And so, you know, when we pay people not to work, they don't work. It's not a surprise at all. And so I, I see those supply side factors as being a lot more important in inflation right now than I do the demand side factors of too much money driving people to be spending too much. Um, that could change. Uh, but right now, I, like I said, I don't see it as much of a worry. Those factors that I think are driving it are, are mostly short term. Um, and we haven't seen much of a problem in terms of overall price level increase uh, that we would expect from a monetary policy effect. So before we move on to the next question, this is a, a weird thing I saw on the internet one day where they, uh, where they were talking about the current chairman, uh, Chairman Powell, and they, they compared them to uh, Chairman Volcker, who was obviously 
a very famous Fed chair for being very disciplined and widely regarded as you know just a great Fed chair. So, just you, what are your opinions on uh, the current policies of Fed Chair Powell? So the the comparison between Powell and Volcker is I, I presume that people were saying they're basically the opposites because Volcker came in at a time at the end of the 1970s when inflation uh, was in double digits and he was trying to end inflation so he raised interest rates uh, and intentionally put the economy into a recession so that so that um, runaway inflation would stop and they could end that and sure enough that was that was effective. Um, and we, after that, we had low inflations for decades and Powell comes in coming, doing more or less the opposite that, you know, we've seen low inflation for decades and now we're seeing this huge explosion in the, in the base money supply. Um, and so should we worry about inflation? You know, again, I think that that perspective is largely based on the understanding that we had in monetary policy before the financial crisis. I think a lot of people that are saying that don't understand that those rules no longer apply. I mean, we're literally rewriting all of the textbooks, not all of them. Some people are in college right now learning out of the old textbooks that still are talking about the old way the mon uh, monetary system works. And so the way that it works right now is that putting money into the economy, putting money into the financial system doesn't create inflation unless that money actually gets into the economy and very little of it is. You know, right now, again, roughly as a rule of thumb, we could think about 10% of the money that we're doing in terms of QE actually makes it into the economy. And so that's just not enough to be causing a huge amount of inflation right now. Um, that that could change, um, but I, I, you know, I don't think it will. I think it's unusual, the, the, the things that Powell has done in a couple of ways. One is that I, I think that Powell um, sometimes doesn't make this distinction himself that when he's talking to people, he says, you know, our, our monetary policy has been effective. It's stimulating growth and spending um, without emphasizing the, the way that the monetary system has changed. Um, the other thing that I mentioned before is about the emergency lending that, you know, previous Fed chair said they would never be involved with with lending to state and local governments, with lending to not bank companies, that that's not the Fed's job. You know, in 2008, Ben Bernanke did a lot of emergency lending that I thought was probably unnecessary. But when the government asked him, when the Treasury asked him, hey, will you bail out GM and bail out these auto companies? He said, that's not our job. The Fed does not get involved with non-bank companies, right? And so he, you know, stuck, uh, stuck to what economists thought was the way that that should be appropriately handled, whereas Powell is not. And I'm quite surprised about that. And so, you know, that makes me a little bit more worried about what um, other policies he might do that people think are, you know, traditionally not the proper role of the Fed. And it worries me that, again, the political situation of keeping interest rates low or doing too much monetary policy, letting inflation run too, um, too high for a little while, I think it's it's less of a technical factor it's less of a worry because of the the money in the economy right now as it is a problem of of politics that there that he or we may get a new fed chair soon you know whoever becomes the new fed chair they might be subject to a political um motive in a way that past fed chairs have not and so that to me is a, is a much bigger worry so that actually brings us conveniently to our next question, uh, which is the fusion of politics and monetary policy. So, you know, here we are at the American Institute for Economic Research up in uh, Western Massachusetts, not too far away in upstate New York. There is a institute called the Levy Institute at Bard College, uh, which is very famous uh, for uh, advocating for something called modern monetary policy, um, which essentially goes, you know, we can print more money. We've seen that we printed all this money. Uh, the economy didn't blow up in COVID-19 and they put out an article advocating that we should continue this, right? We can, um, with this new, now with our newfound strength and printing money and low interest rates, we can uh, fund some huge infrastructure bills. We can spend more money to create universal basic income. We could have a Green New Deal, right? All the stuff that, you know, you could ever want uh, the government to do, uh, we can just fund that by printing more money and not um, taxing more. So I just wanted to, uh, what are your uh, takes and stances on that idea? So, Modern monetary theory, in my opinion, is not something credible and not something that should be taken seriously. So, you know, modern monetary theory, like you said, um, claims that we can sp 
spend as much money as we want and we will never get any, any inflation. And they'll use the example of the recent decades where that's been happening since 2009. But as I was saying before, that completely misunderstands what's happened in the financial system and the way that the monetary policy system operates, that it's fundamentally changed since 2008 and 2009. And so we can't expect that old view um, to be the same today. Um, monetarism still is correct, uh, but the way that the monetary system functions is fundamentally different. And so that's why they're misunderstanding that all this money that we've put into the banking system never gets into the economy. Therefore, we should not expect it to create inflation. And so that's, in my opinion, they're misrepresenting or misunderstanding what's been happening in the economy. Now, bigger picture, modern monetary theory is not something that any serious economist believes in or, or finds credible. You know, even hard left economists like Paul Krugman and Larry Summers don't believe it at all. I mean, Paul Krugman said that he said, this idea is just obviously indefensible, obviously indefensible. I mean, you know, he, he's like, we can't even take this seriously. Larry Summers said, it's a recipe for economic disaster. And I mean, these are very hard left economists. I mean, Paul Krugman has never met a spending program he doesn't like. And yet this theory that supports his own policy views, he's willing to say like, this is obviously wrong, right? This just doesn't make any sense at all. And so if those people are willing to say it's crazy talk, I think we can all admit, you know, this is something we probably shouldn't be listening to. Um, I, and I, it's from the economic side, you know, it's, it's just not a sound fundamental theory in the sense that it's not really a theory. It's really just some ideas that have been kind of cobbled together and used to, to support certain pro, uh, policy proposals without having a coherent theory. And what I mean by that is if you have a theory, you have to think about all the different effects that it might have and draw them together so that you can't be, um, so that you understand how everything works together. So if we say like, um, so so something that you might think of is uh, attacks on cigarettes. You know, some people, when, when a politician says it, they're going to say, okay, so a tax on cigarettes is gonna bring in a bunch of money and it's also going to cause people to quit smoking. Well, it can't be both of those. You know, one of those things is gonna happen and not the other one. If it causes a lot of people to quit smoking, it's not gonna bring in a bunch of revenue. If it brings in a bunch of revenue, it's not gonna cause people to quit smoking. It could be somewhere in the middle, but you can't have high responses on both of those margins. And that's how the theory works. It shows you there are trade-offs between these things. Modern monetary theory has never been written down in a theory to talk about what those trade-offs are. There's literally never been a single paper that I'm aware of in any major journal uh, in modern monetary theory. I mean, Stephanie Kelton's book, The Deficit Myth, she cites a couple of papers that are you know, very minor things where they talk about one part of it or another part of it. Again, no full theory that I'm aware of has ever been published. And so we just can't take it seriously because you can't tell when you do this one thing, what happens over here? Well, how, how, are, how are these trade-offs working? Because there's no coherent theory, it allows the modern monetary theory people, the supporters, to do this kind of bait and switch, you know, kind of dodging when you say, ah, oh, what about this? And they say, oh, no, I said this other thing, right? And no matter when you try to pin them down, they just pivot to a different point. And you say, well, what, you know, if uh, money, money, you know, creates inflation and they're like, oh, no, it doesn't. But even if it did, we would do this other thing. We would get it with regulations. Like, but regulations didn't work in the 1970s. They're like, oh, well, we'll get it with taxes. And they'll, you know, they just constantly pivot without being able to um, uh, be pinned down because they've not written down anywhere what those trade-offs are. And so I just don't think it's realistic. I mean, it requires you to believe that putting money into the economy doesn't create inflation. That's something that no serious economist believes. It requires you to believe that uh, government spending is not related to taxes and bonds. I mean, that's the things that we started off talking about. Like the very first thing that you would learn about fiscal policy is spending by the treasury, fiscal policy has to come from taxes um, and the issuance of bonds, right? And so they just say, oh, that's just not true. Like no serious economist believes that. Um, and so you can't, can't make these outrageous claims and expect for economists to take you seriously. The only reason that we're even talking about this, like it's so absurd. I, I'm, I'm sorry that we have to waste people's times, but the reason that we have to talk about it is politicians love it, right? They love the idea that they can just spend and spend and spend, and there's never gonna be any consequence from that. Um, and so of course, if people are 
taking this seriously as support for any kind of policy, we need to stand up and say, no, 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 this is not true. No serious economist believes this. There's no reason we should be taking it seriously. We really shouldn't even be talking about it, in my opinion. Uh, it's that absurd. And so I'm sorry that we, you know, that we have to do this, but I, I hope readers will, uh, viewers will realize that and, you know, understand that it's not something that economists believe is credible. And this has been a public service announcement from Tom Hogan. <laughs> uh, moving into our final question. So here at AIER, we like to talk about uh, sound money, sound economics. Um, so on that note, how confident are you in the future of fiat currency regimes across the world after all these unprecedented policies? And then I guess on a hopefully on a better note, what are you what are your views on the future of money, especially given the new types of currencies like cryptocurrency and digital currency? Yeah, so that's a great question about what's going to happen in the future here. And I, I think that it's it's a little bit strange because even though the Federal Reserve has been doing a lot of unprecedented policies of which I am highly critical, um, they're pretty good relative to a lot of other central banks. And so that gives the Fed and I think, other you know, some other central banks, uh, a lot of staying power and a lot of credibility. You know, the, the United States, um, the Fed has kept inflation reasonably low for decades. And even though, you know, I think they could do a lot better, they've done better than, you know, almost every other country in the world. And so that has given the United States a little bit of uh, extra credibility and made our made the dollar widely accepted throughout the world. And it helps our economy and draws in um, foreign capital and things that give the Fed a lot more staying power, even if it's not really totally credible. And so I love uh, cryptocurrencies. I love uh, monetary alternatives. Uh, I think that the gold standard historically did a lot better actually than people give it credit for. And you can you know, read about that at AIER. Um, but I don't think, I, I think that the Fed's credibility right now is pretty high. And so I don't see uh, a big change in the US financial system, uh, monetary policy system going on for a while. Where I think crypto could really be a big advantage is in countries that don't have that. So, you know, a lot of countries that don't have a credible monetary system, um, they're there might be getting a lot of inflation or something where they people don't want to use their local currency. Uh, traditionally, some countries have gotten out of that through dollarization. There are more than a dozen countries where the central banks performed so poorly that the people started adopting the dollar and using that as their own currency, even within the country, uh, and because that was their only alternative. Now, cryptocurrencies provide a credible alternative to that. I have friends that are from Brazil and other um, South and Central American countries that use cryptocurrency almost exclusively because they don't want the threat of a lot of inflation. In some countries, they're potentially trying to be tracked by the government and they don't want to, you know, they want to get around that using cryptocurrencies. Uh, and so I think in those countries, crypto has a lot more possibility for widespread acceptance. In the United States, it'll be used by a lot of people that are interested in it. And I, you know, I am invested in cryptocurrency and I use it for transactions, but I don't use it for, you know, most of my uh, economic spending. And I imagine it'll be a long time before most Americans are willing to do that. And so I see, I would love to see some test cases of other countries that just move predominantly to crypto. We'll see, especially in countries that don't have legal tender laws where they're already dollarized or they're using some kind of foreign currency. Do people in those countries uh, find crypto to be a credible alternative? I think it would be really neat if they did and it would clearly be helpful um, for gaining more widespread acceptance in cryptocurrency. Uh, my ideal for the United States would simply be to allow people to use whatever currency they want, you know, allow competition in currency and whatever is the best, most stable currency will end up winning out. If the Fed can do a good job preserving the credibility of the dollar, then that would be get great. People could continue to use the dollar. Um, gold is still widely considered a hedge on inflation and, and a lot of investors that are afraid of US dollar policies are invested in gold. A lot of people would like to go back to the gold standard. Uh, it's a little bit harder to do that because the gold standard requires everybody or a large portion of the economy to be on it to really be beneficial. Uh, crypto doesn't. You know, crypto, you can use a lot of different cryptocurrencies. People don't even have to be using the same one to transact. And so um, I see that as something that is feasible, at least on the small scale. And if, if it were allowed in the United States, if we allowed competition in currency, then maybe we would see something like that. 
uh, really take off and become a you know true alternative uh, to the U.S. dollar. Tom, if we had more time, I'd love to ask you if Dogecoin is going to replace the dollar, but that's all about all the time we have uh, for today. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for appearing on the show today. Uh, to our listeners, if you'd like to engage with more of AIER's content, you can find it on Facebook, Twitter, as well as our website, AIER.org. If you really like what you heard, like to support more of our programming and more of our content, please consider donating. All this can be found at AIER's website at AIER.org. Thank you.